So welcome everybody to a LAMS virtual conversation. Uh, we have been doing these events since March on a fairly regular basis. This is the last of the season. We will see how the schedule picks up after the new year. We do ask you all to keep your microphones muted. We will be recording this. We will take Q&A questions on the chat. And at the end, uh, we will open up the uh, discussion for more questions and answers. Uh, for those of unfamiliar, the LAMS is the oldest professional theatrical organization in the United States. It actually began in London 1869, and it's been in New York since 1874. And over the years in history, it was LAMS who founded the Actors Fund, ASCAP, Actors' Equity, United Artists, Paramount Pictures, Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, even most recently in the merger that created SAG-AFTRA. And uh, we are a social club for people in the entertainment and fine arts. And we're very pleased to have our guest speaker tonight who actually uh, did speak in person at the LAMS a few years ago and give a lovely presentation. We're excited to have her back, but I'm gonna turn over now to our uh, host who is a recent LAMB, Foster Hirsch, take it away. Okay, thank you, Mark. It's wonderful to be here this evening with a very nice uh, audience to talk to Maria Cooper, who is a good friend of mine and who is the daughter of one of the greatest of all movie stars, Gary Cooper. And Maria has been the most devoted daughter. I was saying to her the other night, she said, she said it sounds boring. I don't think it sounds boring at all. She is an immaculate daughter. She is I have a devoted most, father. What am I going to, come on. <laughs> you're the most devoted daughter. That brings me to my first question. You had great parents. To, to, for somebody to be as loyal as you've been and be as dedicated to preserving your father's legacy of, as you have been for decades now, he was the great dad. Well, he was a great dad. You're 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 certainly right. Um, but I my uh, um, I, I I always get a little bit um, if not not from the feminist side. But you know, it takes two. <laughs> and if my mother hadn't been the mother she was, and uh, number one, the partner to him that she was, but number two, the mother to me that she was, um, we were very much like sisters. <laughs> in fact, which was great. But um, you know, it's it certainly isn't easy uh, to be the wife of someone like Gary Cooper. And um, you know, she was a beautiful woman <laughs> who never thought she was beautiful. And when I look at the pictures, and she said, "Oh my goodness, I wasn't bad, was I?" <laughs> I said, "You know, you weren't bad." <laughs> but um, you know, uh, it's 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 tough out there. And uh, she just she she really she bound us together as a family. Uh, which my father wanted, and she knew how to do it. And um, it was, uh, I, 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 really, I really lucked out. We, my husband and I have, a, have had a, a mutual friend who was very close and uh, she had the uh, privilege of having a very, very famous father, not in the film world, in a different world. And she married a very, very famous husband. And, the polar opposite to my experience. She, she said once with a very sort of grim face, oh, I feel like a hero sandwich. <laughs> and she, you know, the best of either side, she wasn't able to enjoy, be thankful for. So I'm just a, a pile of greatness <laughs> of, of, of when, great Maria, Maria, when you were growing up in in Beverly Hills, Brentwood, Homeby Hills, you surely had friends who also had famous movie stars as parents. Oh, yes. Did, yeah. did you compare your lucky situation with, with their situations, which may not have been as fortunate as yours? Did you see uh, difficult relationships between famous parents and children? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. The the one that, that stands out most obviously in my mind was uh, Christina Crawford, Joan Crawford's daughter, who, um, you know, we were very good. We play dates together all the time. And actually, 
I had a nanny, a governess, and when she left me, because I was getting too old for that, um, she went to take care of Christina. And, um, you know, I, I get annoyed at people who, who criticize Christina for writing Mommy Dearest, because um, what I saw was uh, that book is no exaggeration. And sadly, I think Joan was not well <laughs> emotionally. Yes. And, um, and it's strange because, you know, she adopted two other children and they, it was a different woman. So, you know, who can, who can, who, who, who can figure, but, but, um, but I think I was probably, probably the, 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 the closest to my luck, <laughs> I would say was uh, Jimmy Stewart and uh, Gloria, his wife uh, and their children. Um, you know, I mean, because the Stewarts were terrific. They were close, close to my parents too. But, but, they, but they were good parents. They were good parents, yeah. yeah. Would you say on balance that was rare? Yes. In that era in Hollywood for world famous parents, world famous movie stars to be wonderful parents, rather rare? I would say rather rare, I think because there had to have been, uh, I think what, what became prevalent in most families was a jealousy of the one spouse who was getting all the attention and the other who was maybe, I don't know, maybe an accountant, maybe an agent, maybe, um, you know, I mean, maybe someone working in the industry, which probably made it better. But, um, but I think, I also think it makes a difference if the, if the movie star was the same sex as the, as the child. I think it was tougher, uh, tougher on the child. You know, um, I, think, I think Gary Crosby was named after my father because Bing and my father were close. Uh, I think Gary Crosby had a rough time because he was Bing Crosby's son. Um, you know, if he had been Bing Crosby's daughter, it might have been easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I observed. <laughs> anyway. When what age were you when you realized that you had a father who was world famous, and when you would go out in public, were, did people stop him? Were you aware that that he was this public figure from a very early age? Oh yeah, yeah. But he, Yes, it, it was it was um, it was easier then. I mean, uh, it, living in Beverly Hills or visiting Brentwood or visiting Rodeo Drive was a lot simpler then. There wasn't all the you know um, uh, I won't say um, Rodeo Drive wasn't trying to compete with uh, Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Um, no, it, it was, I, I grew up there too. It was elegant and modest, actually. It was small it, scale. It was, it was elegant, modest, small scale. People, people treated my father like, um, oh, hi, Mr. Cooper. And, you know, when, when he was going into the sports shop to, you know, um, get a, uh, to buy a fishing rod or something. Um, uh, it was, um, it was very, very different. <laughs> Did, did people approach him? Did they invade your privacy as a family when you were out in public? Did people approach him asking uh, for autographs or photographs? Yeah, but but very politely, very nicely. And and um, I don't know my father. You know, I guess he figured it went with the territory, and he was he was you know unless someone came up when you had a big fork full of spaghetti coming out of your mouth. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was happy to um, accommodate. And um, I, 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 think, I think it would kind of annoy him if, if a sort of older woman who was clearly coming to get an autograph for herself, but then she would put it off on her mother or her grandmother. Oh, my grandmother used to love you. And <laughs> come on, you know, <laughs> what is your name, <laughs> ma'am? <laughs> Were you, did you uh, go on to your father's sets a lot, or was that uh, an infrequent occurrence? It was fairly infrequent, actually. He 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 felt sets were boring for you know people to have to hang around if they weren't doing anything. Um, maybe it made him nervous too. I don't know. Um, um, I remember very distinctly the the few sets that I was on. 
Um, There's a famous picture of you on the set of High Noon. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 the cover of of the book that I did called Gary Cooper Off Camera, A Daughter Remembers. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was um, that was a special day. It was, it was a wonderful day. Uh, uh, do you, do, Maria, do you consider yourself a student of your father's work? Have you seen everything? I haven't seen I haven't seen some of the silent films, um, <clears throat> and I know quite a few of them are available now in the Criterion Collection and, and all of that. Um, uh, only as I've gotten older have I sort of looked looked at them analytically, or looked at him as an actor analytically. It, it was just, uh, you know, he was my father and uh, this is what he did. And, um, uh, you know, my parents always, back to your other question, you know, what was it like with people coming up and, you know, asking for <clears throat> an autograph and all that. Um, my mother always said, um, hey Maria, don't forget, this has got not a damn thing to do with you. <laughs> you know, you know, he's worked for it. He's earned it. People are coming to, you know, acknowledge their uh, gratitude to him for giving them pleasure and all that. And, um, you know, he's worked bloody hard for it. And um, he deserves that. And, and uh, but, but that's not you, you know, you've got to go earn your own, <laughs> do your own thing. When you look at your father's work, uh, do you have favorites? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, I, I have to say, I've, I've told you this before, but in my opinion, all, virtually the two greatest performances I know of in American movies are Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront, mm -hmm. which is incomparable. Yeah. But right up there is Gary Cooper in High Noon. I mean, that is a model of a movie performance. It's so subtle, mm -hmm. so understated, so real, so grounded, and so effortless. He doesn't for one second let you catch him acting. No, well, that I think that was one of his, his uh, skills. I know, I guess, several uh, of the well, finest actors I've observed, like, well, uh, Charles Lawton, for instance, I mean, he he said said something similar, you know that 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 my father's um, that you just didn't think he was doing a damn thing up there, and all of a sudden, you know, you saw the rushes the next day, and you said, "Holy Toledo!" You know, he's <laughs> he's acting circles around me, and I'm just <laughs> standing there. <laughs> but um, but he was, you know, it was part of his nature to be simple, and and uh, he 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 really. He would. He thought into. I, mean, I think Stanis, Stanislavski even said, "Oh, Cooper's you know, a method actor." Well, uh, he wouldn't have identified himself that way, but he really thought hard about the character that he was portraying. And uh, if it was a historical character, he read up about him uh, as much as, as as he could, and um, you know he felt. The more he knew about the person or the surround of the person, uh, the less he had to act. He could just be natural. So, but it was, it, was, it was a naturalism based on real work and preparation. He didn't yeah. just walk onto the set. He had the gift of after having done the work of making it seem easy, but there was mm -hmm. work behind it. Yeah, yeah. There was work and thought behind it. He, yes. did, did he talk about favorite? Did he, did he talk about his work to you a lot? Did he say, well, this one really worked and this one maybe was a little disappointing? Did he share those sorts of uh, trade secrets with you? He didn't talk, he didn't talk shop around me or that I heard that much. Um, uh, <clears throat> I know he loved High Noon. I mean, I, I, I know he, he was he, he was proud of High Noon. Oh, good. <laughs> he loved loved working with Fred Zinnemann, too. Of course, that was great. And um, and uh, one of his big buddies from his first early group of films was Henry Hathaway as as a director. And you know, they did some pretty <laughs> some good 
good shoot him up stuff. Uh, not only Westerns, you know, other stories, but he, um, I know he loved doing Friendly Persuasion, the Quaker story. Um, he was honored, honored to portray Lou Gehrig. I mean, that, that I think um, really humbled him. Um, not that he needed to be humbled, but it, 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 it was a profoundly moving role for him to take on. And, and he liked, and you like, and I like, one of his last films, which is very dark and uncharacteristic, The Hanging Tree. The Hanging Tree, yes. It's so yes. well known, but that's an awfully good film with an unlikely Gary Cooper performance. I wish, more, I wish more people knew of it, uh, or I guess, is it available on, on uh, DVD? I, I believe it is, and but, one, um, but it, 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 it's, it's a surprising view of Gary Cooper. It's a dark film. It's much darker than he usually did. and and. I know you like it in particular that it is, a, is of interest. Yeah, no, no, he, he, he loved it because he loved working with um, Maria Schell. That was her first American film, I think. And I think it was George C. Scott's first film. And he loved Carl Molden. I mean, he and, he and, he, he and Carl were, were, were great friends. But, um, you know, I think, uh, I think maybe we <laughs> talked about this before, but he was asked, well, you know, Mr. Cooper, what makes you choose? The, rule, the roles that you take. And um, he always said, I want to try to portray the best a man can be. And I think his character in The Hanging Tree by the name of Joe Frail, which is interesting. Yes. Um, you sort of see someone going through his own dark cycle and um, coming out at the end, um, uh, honorable. Um, but after a struggle, quite a struggle to get to that honor. A big struggle. I mean, like like you kick the guy over the ravine and <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if our, our listeners should know that film. It's really, it's a, it's a terrific late Gary Cooper movie, wow. The Hang Free, Thank very you. unexpected. Very unexpected. And a wonderful theme song uh, too. Um, it's a very haunting song. Um, and um, and you know, Delmar Daves was the was the director, <clears throat> and and I think Del had some I don't know kidney problem or something. And he was off the set for about a week due to health, and um, they didn't know what to do. And my father said to Carl Molden, "Go on, you can you know you can handle the directing. Go on." And Carl said, "Ah, Coop, what do you say?" My father said, do it, I trust you. And he did. <laughs> and directed other things as well. Yeah, yeah, afterwards. <laughs> Went on to have a bit of a directing career. Yeah. Was your father able to handle the magnitude of his success? I mean, I gather he was a very grounded man. He was world famous. He was able he to handle be... that, that fame and that, that uh, attention. Yes, uh, he didn't. He didn't think about it. I mean, he wasn't. Um, I think he sort of. He didn't laugh at it, but he thought it was amusing that people would go so, you know, gaga over him. Um, I think, first of all, when he was younger and terribly good looking. Uh, and then as he got older and as he matured and still good looking <laughs> and, and, and still good looking um, as an actor, uh, you know, he was he, he felt he was always learning. And I think we said this before, but it's true. One of the last. Actually, I think the only time I heard him complain when he was ill with cancer. And it was like a month or so before he died. And the only complaint I heard him say was, um, he said, damn it, just when I was beginning to learn what acting was all about. So, you know, and that was age. That's he just had his 60th birthday. Yeah, that's, that's very revealing. Now you, in terms of your 
devotion to your father's legacy. You've done two books. They're behind you, and let's let's mention them. And then you've worked on several of uh, uh, tel television biographies oh. of him. Well. So you've done a lot of work in terms of honoring and and preserving your father's legacy. Tell us about the two books that I see. Well, the the, behind the, you. the, the, the first one, I, I don't know, can it be seen? Can, um, or should I grab it? Grab it, I think, Maria. Oh, sorry. Um, um, this, uh, does that show? Yes. That shows. Yes. Well, that it, is the, the picture referred to on, on, on the set of High Noon, actually. It was very hot and everybody was uh, thirsty and they took a break and my father ran around and got this, you know, Krispy Kreme ice cream <laughs> or something. And <laughs> we all um, did it. Actually, this book is very much thanks to my mother who kept, she took wonderful photographs and she kept ex ex copious albums. And um, I'm afraid I dismantled some of them to put this book together, but uh, they're really, family pictures and, and, um, and, and wonderful, wonderful pictures. Um, but, you know, many, many people said, oh, aren't you gonna write a book about growing up in Hollywood? I said, no, <laughs> I mean, um, the book they want, they wanted me to write, I'm not about to, <laughs> I'm not about to write. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, you know, his life was images and the images here, and I have little captions and all that. Um, that that um, that was what our life experience was. Mine, luckily, and um, and my parents. So it, um, I think, it 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 captures the glamour, and it also captures the personal the personal life, the personal side of of um, of him, and. Um, um, I have something in the in the back, actually. Um, you know, my father and Hemingway were very close, and of course, one of his favorite films. To jump back to your question, was for whom the bell tolls. And when he was ill, he always loved that John the John Donne poem, from which the title "For Whom the Bell Toll" comes. And he said to my mother, he said, "Get me a pad and some paper." Because I want to write, I want to remember the poem, and I want to write it out myself. So there is a reproduction in this of in his own handwriting, and then, uh, and of course, the the famous final line: "Do not seek to know for whom the bell tolls; it tolls for thee." And um, you know it. it it struck him very profoundly. And, and at, at the very end, he was too, I think too much medication. He couldn't finish it. So my mother finished the writing. So the handwriting changes, but, um, but you know, he, he, he uh, uh, toward the end, he was very, very taken with the writing of Thomas Merton, uh, the Trappist wonderful yes. writer, monk. And um, uh, you know, he just he, he felt well. He felt that he had had a very blessed life and uh, cut off much too soon. But you know, I got to say, I was hard put to find a photograph where he didn't have a damn cigarette between his fingers, hanging out of his lips, um, holding it, and you know. Um, I mean, those were the days and everybody smoked. And um, I, I remember driving down Sunset Boulevard toward Hollywood and there was a big, you know, one of the big posters, one of the big um, billboards. And it was my father was advertising Chesterfields. And, you know, there he was, you know, five times larger than life, puffing on a Chesterfield. <laughs> and he tried to quit so many times and it was never worked. Addictive, and they didn't have Nicorette in those days. Tell us about the other book, uh, the Enduring other, Child. The, 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 the other book, um, I, I had the great fortune to um, uh, meet, and we sort of the idea cooked up together. 
uh, it's called Gary Cooper Enduring Style. And um, my co-author, he really did all the writing, is a wonderful gentleman who knows the fashion industry backward and forward. And this, this is um, the book that, that we did. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Can you see it? Um, and uh, again, photographs, Bruce writes a lot about, uh, about style of dress, style of, of um, it's, it's not only about clothing, it's about lifestyle. Um, that's a, <laughs> a funny picture. That was my father's humor. Can you see it? Yes. <laughs> He's wrapped in a zebra skin. Yes. <laughs> you can move it over just a little bit. It was kind of blocking the pictures I have here. I have pictures okay. of the other. Can you bring, bring it a little more to your right, to your right, to your right. Yeah, there we go. Nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. But Maria, this book is about to be republished. Yes, I, I, I'm absolutely thrilled. Powerhouse Books is um, reissuing it, I think, I think fairly soon. I mean, within the next couple of months, I hope. So I'm, it, it, it did very well. And I was very flattered that um, uh, Ralph, Ralph Lauren wrote the foreword for this. So um, I was very grateful for, for this. What, and, what's your, uh, what's your... Was your father a stylish dresser? Yes, but completely natural. I mean, he put things together. He didn't have a dresser, you know. He 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 he, he put it together, and he 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 seemed to mix and match very well, very naturally. Um, uh, the other person, I I I was very lucky because to have Ralph Lauren do the introduction for this, and for the other one, Gary Cooper off camera. Um, someone that I just wished they had known each other, but someone who I'm a huge fan of today is Tom Hanks. And he wrote the foreword for uh, American Life, American Legend. He's so, some, in, in a way, he's in the tradition of your father. Yeah, his yeah. persona and his acting in yeah, that tradition, I would, I would say that. He has one of my father's saddles too, which oh, really? <laughs> pleases me no end. <laughs> Let's talk about the uh, the shows that you worked on for TV, and and I think uh, when we talk about the first one, you're going to introduce a a song for us that we're going to hear. Oh yes, well that that was um, uh, one I I I love the way he wrote, so I tracked down um, Richard Schickel. I don't know. Did you ever know him? Yes, I did. Uh, so, so Richard did did the uh, uh, the documentary, and um, uh, Clint Eastwood was the host. And it really wasn't so much talking heads. It was Richard wrote a very, very, very interesting life of Gary Cooper, and Clint, you know, did it beautifully, and. Um, and I, I uh, 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 imposed on my husband, <laughs> Byron Janice, who was, was doing a lot of, starting a lot of composing and was really doing a lot of it now. But I, I really wanted a special Gary Cooper theme. And I asked Byron if he would uh, try it. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, please, please, please. So I came home one day and Byron said, sit down, let me play what I've written. It was as if my father had walked into the room. I only started to cry. I mean, he sort of captured, he never knew my father, but, but he captured the essence of Gary Cooper. So um, it's sort of, it runs through the documentary whenever it's strictly um, sh showing, you know, home movies or images or talking about Cooper. Um, only instrumental in the documentary. So a couple of years later, we had lyrics put to it because really thinking about what Gary Cooper stood for in the film world, um, he did play the heroic person, be it uh, you know, be it Alvin York or or, um, or Dr. Wassel or Captain Billy Mitchell, um, or just a fictional character. It doesn't matter. 
um, or the sheriff. <laughs> yes, <know>. Will Payne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's called song. Uh, uh, it's called song for a hero. And um, Byron, uh, Byron was asked to perform a couple of years ago for um, the Voice of America. Uh, he did, you know, a series of concerts for them, and. Um, this was their inaugural concert. And we wanted both, we both felt, wouldn't it be nice, be wonderful to, if that song could, could be played. So Byron, along with Chopin and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff, <laughs> um, Byron, he, he, he played two of his own compositions, one other one that's for, from a show. And um, we were able to get a, a sergeant Kevin Benier, who was the lead singer of the White House uh, Marine Corps band. And so he sings the song. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called, in, in the context of the song, it's called A Hero's Passing By. So I think, that, Mark, that's a good cue for us to hear the song. Mr. Janus has written popular songs and ballads, among them the next selection on our program, that surprise I talked about earlier. It's called Heroes Passing By. The lyrics are by Barbara Campbell, and it is dedicated to the centenary of the American film star Gary Cooper, Mr. Janus's father-in-law, and also to all American heroes for whom Mr. Cooper was a symbol. Our vocalist is Staff Sergeant Kevin Benear, a soloist with the United States Marine Band. Byron Janus accompanies in his own composition, Heroes Passing By. When he first says hello, you hardly look his way. And yet you're drawn to the man And you really don't know why And as he turns to go You notice folks are watching him As if they believe there's a hero passing by He's a hard man to know So silent that you overlook the ghost of a smile the glimmer in his eye and the fire won't show until his very soul is touched and then you'll be sure there's a hero passing by he'll be patient he'll be gentle but inside him there is steel you can trust him you can love him he is thoughtful, he is real, but I wonder if he's different, can we ever understand? And I wonder if he's different, he's a hero, he's a man. Why does one man risk his future? Why would one man walk through fire? Is it courage? Is it conscience? Is it duty or desire? But I wonder if he's different. Can we ever understand? And I wonder if he's different. He's a hero. He's a man. Why does one man walk through fire? Is it courage? Is it conscience? Is it duty or desire? But I wonder if he's different. Can we ever understand? And I It was 
was long, long ago, but I can still remember as he stood on that hill and he waved his last goodbye. It was long, long ago, but sometimes as the shadows fade, I still see that tall silhouette against the sky, a hero's passing by. Magnificent, oh, it's so and, and that does summon that summon that summons the iconography of your father. It does, and you know, I thought when we were speaking about all this, oh my God, today, how many heroes we need to honor and pray for and thank, and um, it's just I'm so happy, grateful for the opportunity to have it heard. Having heard the song composed by your husband. Forgive me, but I have to ask this question. You're the daughter of a world famous father, and then you married a world famous man. Are there any comparisons between them? <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not obvious, maybe, but um, yikes. <laughs> I didn't expect that question. <laughs> Um, yes, there are um, very, very deep similarities and um, uh, um, on the more superficial side, a sense of humor, which I don't think people might necessarily assume my father had, which he did, and Byron has tremendously. Um, a, Great, a great sense, a, a, a great passion um, I can't what to say it. Passion for the creative, for beauty, for um, for going beneath the surface of things. Um, uh, a great sense of anger at injustice. I think that's those was very much part of my father and very much part of, of, of Byron. Um, he he refused to go and play concerts down south during the Selma march, and I mean he, he you know he. Um, he refused to go to South Africa. There was a big concert tour scheduled, and you know they said, um, you know, Byron said, "Well, I want to play for a, you know a, a mixed audience." Oh no, 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 you can't. You can play for a black audience one night and a white audience the other. And Byron said, "Oh no, I don't. <laughs> no way." And so then this was before the apartheid finished. But so then they said, "Well, Mr. Janis, play for the radio. Play a uh, a concert with the radio orchestra." He said, no way, <laughs> no way, you know, it's either in person in the flesh or it's not. And so we never went. <laughs> but I, 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 I want to share because I, I, I know this about your father talking about a heroic act. When your father made High Noon, the screenwriter Carl Foreman was on the verge of being blacklisted. Oh, yes. He, did, he was a communist, and but he did want to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And the producers of the film and Stanley Kramer sort of wanted to ease Carl Foreman out of the project. And your father, whose politics were the exact opposite of to the left, mm -hmm. said, if you fire Carl Foreman, I'm walking off this film. Absolutely true. I think your, your use of the word ease <laughs> was very, very understated. I mean, 
they wanted Carl. My father called him Uncle Carl. I mean, he had a great affection for him. And um, their politics couldn't have been more different, but it didn't matter. He respected him and he wanted him to keep his job. Yes. And 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 he loved him as a human being. I mean, politics be damned. It doesn't matter. It really didn't matter. In fact, he was he was about to sign a contract to uh, form a company to work together with with Foreman and um, Foreman had to go to England and it all got very very messy but um, and and you know certain certain of my father's colleagues who were of a different political persuasion uh, literally said to Gary Cooper you'll never work in this blank blank town again because he stood up for Carl Foreman because he stood up for Carl Foreman right but it did it he there was no other way he would do it. He That's worked how he had to do it. He <laughs> yeah. had to do it that way. He had to do it. Yeah. I want to, we have a lot yeah. to cover, but I want to move on before we open it. We have a wonderful anecdote. Before I get to that, did was there any ever any family pressure, or did you ever think you wanted to go into acting? Was there a moment when you thought, maybe, well, maybe that's for me too? Um. Well, not. Not really. Um, uh, I entertained the thought when we first got the got news that my father was terminally ill, and I, you know, had this thing. Oh well, you know, carry on the name and blah blah blah. It was my late late teens, I guess. And um, uh, I went to an acting coach, and. Um, and then I went to, um, uh, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, Sandy Meisner? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I went, to, I went to, 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 to one of his classes and um, uh, he, <laughs> he said, uh, oh, have, have to do an improvisation. I thought, oh, God. I didn't know which end was, you know, up. Anyway, I did it. And the one thing I was terrified of, uh, which is one reason why I thought I really wouldn't, couldn't be an actor, but that I stuttered terribly, a terrible stutter. So I got through the improvisation and I never stuttered. And I was so proud of myself. I felt so good. And Sandy was sitting in the front row and he sort of said, you know, come down, I want to talk to you. And I was thinking he might tell me, you know, I wasn't terrible. <laughs> the only thing he said to me was, how long have you stuttered? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and under my breath, I was cursing him. I said, why do you say that? How did you know? He said, because every time that you wanted to stutter, you blink a certain way. And that cured, I mean, he was so observant. And he picked up whatever he picked up. Uh, anyway, so that that took care of that. <laughs> but you went on to have a career in painting, and you you're, you're an artist, and you paint. Yeah, I'm a painter. But yeah. you but you have the most delicious story that I know our our viewers would like to hear about your meeting with Picasso. Oh yes, we had a wonderful <laughs> wonderful meeting. May uh, could I excuse myself for one? One minute, uh, there was someone knocking at the door. Oh, and okay. we, 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 we had a little crisis here for a, oh. a second. Just a minute, I'll be right, I'll be right back. Excuse me, I'm very sorry. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, guess. Yeah. So, um, so tell tell uh, us about your meeting with Picasso. Yes, we met with we met Picasso through the good graces of our dear, dear, dear friend David Douglas Duncan, the wonderful, great photographer, and he was like part of our family. And and David was really living with Picasso at that point, doing chronicling his his works. So um of course, my mother and father, because they love painting, they had oops, a nice small collection of art. 
So, um, so, so, so David arranged for a meeting. We were staying at, at Edenlock, the Hotel du Cap. And uh, so Picasso and Jacqueline came over for um, cocktails. And, um, you know, very informal. We're just sitting, sitting out on, on the terrace. And um, it was incredibly, you know, my, my French was not good. My father's was not very good either, but there were a lot of, a lot of hand, a lot of hand gestures. <laughs> um, but David, of course, spoke perfect French and Jacqueline's English was right. And, and my mother was all decked. It, it was an exciting, wonderful, time and we were all sitting there it was like five in the afternoon and suddenly I think I don't know if all of you can relate to moments when you wanted to kill your mother <laughs> and this was one of them because in the middle of everything and I'm just listening very happily um, and in awe of being with Picasso my mother turns to me and she says Oh, Maria, go show Picasso your sketchbook. Because being an artist, I was at Chouinard Art Institute and I you know, always carried my sketchbook. And she said, go upstairs and get your sketchbook and bring it down and show it to him. <laughs> of course, I never disobeyed my mother, <laughs> almost never. Well, I didn't this time anyway. <laughs> So um, I could have killed her. Anyway, I went upstairs mortified. I got sketchbook. I brought it downstairs. Um, I gave it to Picasso and he's sitting looking at it and dear David Duncan captured the moment, which I did tell you, I'd bring you a photograph. Yeah. He captured the moment on film. And um, as you can see, I look like I am about to throw up. <laughs> that's, that's the, the nicest way to put it. <laughs> now tell me if you can see this or not. Oh, yeah. uh, oh yes, yes. So there's Picasso with my sketchbook on his knee and I'm looking at him looking at the sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> can you see that? Very, very, very vividly. Very vividly. So yeah. then, as David was working with Picasso, uh, he developed all these pictures, all of his, you know, sh shots. And Picasso saw this and said, "Oh, let me do something for Maria." So Picasso, the drawing around this is Picasso oh. drew uh, like the little Mediterranean villa and whatever else. Greenery. Hold it up a little, Maria. Hold it, hold it up just a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so you're in a Picasso. <laughs> I'm in a Picasso. <laughs> and then, um, and then the, to, to top it all off, there's a little note on the back and David said, uh, oh, Picasso wanted you to have this rose. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's what a, that's, what a wonderful memory that's, that's one of the, one of the extraordinary wonderful memories <laughs> that before we open open it to the house let me ask you about the, the most recent project that you worked on in relation to your father the true gen which which um is a documentary about the the long friendship between your father and hemingway Yes, yes, it, it's, it, it, it is. It was a, it was a very, very interesting concept, and um, I, I, I think it's only available in, um, in, in, in DVDs. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, concept put together uh, by John Mulholland um, of the really, and it was quite an extraordinary friendship. Um, the two men's lives paralleled each other in, in very interesting ways. Uh, significant ways, um, uh, um, and they were, um, you know, they were they were very different people. But um, you know, my father was the one person who could show up unannounced uh, at Hemingway's 
doorstep, be it Key West or Cuba or Sun Valley. Um, uh, and um, I think one of the last conversations my father had with anybody, actually with, with anyone who wasn't in Hollywood was with Ernest because they, um, uh, they were, they were ex ex extremely close. And it's, 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 um, it's, it's a good, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful documentary. It's a little bit long, but, um, uh, and again, my husband had the fun of doing the whole score for that. And it is super, <laughs> super. Cause it, you know, it takes place in, uh, you know, in, 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 in Spain and Cuba and France and out West, um, it's really, uh, it's really good. And then, and then the other thing um, sort of, because I, I, I really wanted there to be a, some kind of a continuity, you know, for my father. And uh, so I've, I've just donated all his memorabilia and archives to, uh, to USC, to uh, the School of Cinematic Arts. Because I think I visited there and it's so exciting. I really wish I were 20 again. Now, what, you know, what's going on in the world of film and, and the new, the new areas are just uh, so exciting. And um, I was trying to think how to honor my father in the best way that he would have liked. And my father always had a great, great love, as I think we've talked about, of um, the American Indian, uh, the Native Americans. And his, his, his first friends, his, his childhood friends were the Indian children up in Helena, Montana in Cascade and all that. So we've started uh, with, with, with USC, um, a Gary Cooper endowment for um, Native American students and indigenous peoples in film and television because uh, he always loved their their sense of storytelling, their imagination, their spirituality, their cultural um, uh, habits and ways. And uh, uh, I think he got his sense of color from studying the way the Indians dressed and put put their own dress together. Um, until they the him, they Marie, him. until the pandemic hit there was going to be a big ceremony at USC announcing this collection and this Yes, yes, endowment. it was supposed to be last April. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, it got scrapped. Uh, we're, we tentatively were looking toward this coming April, but oh, who knows, you know, who knows? nobody knows. There, there certainly will be at some point, um, some kind of a public event because um, it was it was going to be a weekend kind of an, you know, honoring my father and and, um, and you know bringing uh, the, the 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 scholarship has been a little bit under the radar for a few years but you know I hope now <clears throat> excuse me I hope now it can be um, you know it 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 will get more exposure and but we've been able to give out I think six scholarships already and I'm I'm so excited when I read the resumes of these young young people what uh, they're so gifted and, and what they've been able to do and and the School of Cinematic Arts has such a, a broad broad platform for you know young young people interested in pursuing a career in film at, at whatever aspect and, and that department has a long and distinguished history, USC. Cinema it does, studies, yeah. it's, it's as good as it gets. It's as good as it gets. And what I love is that they don't <laughs> throw out the past. They keep, I mean, they sort of honor the past. They live in the present and they look to the future. Wonderful. That's just the way to be. I think with that wonderful statement, Mark, we can open it to the house. I have quite a few questions, so I will skip over some I think have already been answered. The first question from David Dow Bentley, uh, did you come away with any nice stories of Grace Kelly? I, uh, yes, I will, nice stories. <laughs> um, uh, well, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's not really, it's, 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 it's nothing Grace Kelly did, but, um, when I was on, on on the set, 
that happened to be the time they were shooting the wedding scene when, when he, he gets married to her. And um, I guess I, and I never realized what a good actor my father was until that moment because that week and particularly the night before, uh, he had a bad back, a chronic sacroiliac bad back, and he had put it out terribly. He was in great pain during that whole, that whole day of shooting the wedding scene. He was in agony with his back. And the scene, if anyone remembers, calls for him to kiss the bride, pick her up, and put her on a big, um, a big high boy, um, uh, a big, a big bureau, I guess. And um, uh, Grace was not a petite little woman, and she wasn't a dancer. I mean, she didn't know how to help. <laughs> so my father had to lift her really lift her up and put her on this high bureau. And his back was out, he was in great pain. I saw the sweat breaking out on his lip and, but he never grimaced. He just smiled and carried on and was the happy bridegroom. And that, 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 really, that really impressed me. But um, I never saw her much after, after that, actually until we were in the South of France. My husband played a concert in um, Monaco and uh, it was at actually a concert at, at, at the palace and, and, and uh, Grace hosted us afterwards and we had some nice time, you know, reminiscing and talking about the good old days in Hollywood uh, at, at that point. And tagging off of that, there are several other questions asking about was there a leading actress that he loved to work with? Did he generally like his leading ladies? I think he liked most of them. Um, there were a few he had nicknames for, and I, I'm not going <laughs> to say. <laughs> say um, he uh, no, he was he was positive about. Um, you know, I, I think he loved working with Ingrid Bergman. I mean, they, uh, he enjoyed working with, 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 with Grace. I think, you know, it was her first picture and I think she was very nervous and, and, and he, he was very good at putting people at ease, at, at making people relax and not feel, oh my God, you know, I'm in front of Gary Cooper or whoever. Um, you know, he, 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 he worked with some wonderful actresses, uh, Audrey Hepburn, he adored. He really loved he loved Audrey. She was she was dear. I mean, he, and uh, um, uh, Barbara Stanwyck was, I think, someone he really appreciated her gifts, her talent. Um, you know, my father liked people. He 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 really genuinely liked people, and unless someone was A real bitch. <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> uh, uh, or full of themselves, you know, ego, exploding ego type of stuff. Um, other than that, he was he was very um, he he admired other people's talents. He liked to help encourage that and bring them out. Um, well, Ed Jones asked, uh, did he ever fully get his arms around the fact that he was and would be remembered as larger than life? Oh, you didn't hear the question? Maybe, maybe, maybe toward the end, but, but he, he never talked about it. Uh, um, the Friars, he, he was honored by the Friars Club about three months before he died. And um, he worked on his speech with Billy Wilder, um, who he loved working with, by the way, speaking of a, a, a favorite director, as well as William Wilder. But anyway, um, uh, I think he really, one of, one of the things that he said in his, in his uh, talk was what, meant so much to him was the friends that he made in the acting community and how 
how he how he respected his colleagues and um, and how he loved loved the challenge of the medium of film. You know, it was um, it was uh, you know I don't know if that answered your question, but I think that's. Well, we have a question from Maggie about your father working with Walter Brennan, that they had a chemistry that ignited on stream, did several movies together. Was that intentional or coincidence? Um, well, I don't know. You either have chemistry or you don't, don't you think? I, I mean, he and, he, and, he and Walter, yes, they hit it off and it was natural and uh, I think they they relished the chance to to make films together. That's um, that's 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 kind of um, you know I I was sort of young then and I don't recall uh, seeing the two of them together, so I didn't personally experience any um, um, back and forth rapport with them, but but I know he was. Had, a, had had an affection for him for sure. And uh, yeah, they, they, they work well together. <clears throat> All right, from Michael Keller, um, it seems anyone who ever spent time working for Samuel Goldwyn came away with a host of interesting and funny stories about that legendary producer. Did your dad share any with you? Not, not really, no. No, he, he didn't. I, th I think again, he, 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 he worked with Goldwyn when I was quite young. So it, it wasn't like I was sitting around the dining room table hearing him talk about, you know, what happened on the set that day or, um, but I'm, I know they were friends of the Goldwyns. They, they, they saw them a lot. There was, a, there was a period where sort of a certain group were, were playing croquet a lot. And uh, I think the Goldwins were croqueters, <laughs> and uh, they played. Uh, they played along with my uncle, with my great uncle, who was a man named Cedric Gibbons, who was the art director of MGM for 36 years. He really, I think he, in, in many ways, he put MGM on the map, Cedric Gibbons, and uh, he really revolutionized art direction for the film world. And, uh, and he also designed everyone's favorite statue, the Oscar. That was my uncle's uh, contribution. Well, I have still more, but I'm gonna ask Bob Tevis to unmute himself, to ask a question, and then we'll go back to the list. Hey, Maria, I wanted to ask you, do you, have, do you remember any specific instance when your dad came home from work and said, you know, I really liked working with that person and conversely, I'll never work with that person again. Um, no, he never, <clears throat> he never said either of those sentences. He would, he would describe someone as being a character. Uh, uh, he liked Rod Steiger very much, but he was a character. <laughs> um, he, you know, funny comments about that. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I think, I think there were certain, I think there were certain aspects of Marlena Dietrich that he, he liked working with her. And he admired her as an actress, but I think there were certain aspects of her personality that annoyed him. But you know, I, I don't know. I mean, he never, he never really, you know, he he, ne he never brought his work home, <laughs> and um, and probably my mother <laughs> knows knew a lot of stories that I don't. Thank you. Uh, Derek Ward asked if there was a director that your father most liked working with. Well, I, th I think I mentioned a, f a few of them. Uh, Fred Zinneman was really like, like family. Uh, Henry Hathaway, very, very close friend. I mean, I, 
I grew up calling him, you know, Uncle Henry. Do you know, uh, Maria, Henry Hathaway was famous for an extremely volatile temper. I mean, mm -hmm. He was famous for screaming on set. You never saw any of that off stage. I never saw him scream at my father. <laughs> I saw him scream down in Mexico. We were on location making um, Garden of Evil. And uh, it was before cell phones and the, they, had to, they, 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 they had to resort to megaphone, you know, what, what, are they, what are they called? Bullhorns, megaphones. And I thought Henry was gonna have a heart attack because quickly the scene was the good guys are down in the ravine and they're surrounded by 700 Indians who are up on the lip of a mesa. And the 700 Indians were supposed to align themselves in a perfect silhouette across the top of the mesa. And of course, they were not the Rockettes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they didn't get in position right. And Henry was down in the ravine yelling with his bullhorn every four letter, 20 letter word you could imagine. <laughs> Spanish, English, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, he had a volatile temper. Um, and uh, I know Otto, Otto Preminger had a temper. But not with your father. Um, I am told he tried it once and my father walked off the set. Oh. <laughs> And uh, when he came that back, and when, he, when my father walked back on the set, it was cool. <laughs> yeah. the, the, with Otto Preminger, if you stood up to a bully, they backed off. So if you stood up to him, he'd back off. But if you yeah. didn't stand up to him, you'd he get just, more and more and more. Going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, um, uh, William Wyler, my father loved working with. Really. And of course, Billy Wilder, he, he, he loved, loved him too. And um, uh, well, I've got a, a series of questions from Maria, uh, from Cindy Sanders. First, uh, do you actually read the post from the Facebook fan club? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Um, I should, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but, well, no, sometimes I do. That, that, um, that's not true. Sometimes I do, yes. Um, I, don't, I don't live on the computer and I don't live in, in my cell phone. <laughs> uh, so um, I, think, I think there are probably some, some wonderful comments and, and reactions that, that I don't always see. And I think you covered some of her other questions. So her final question was, how did your father come to Catholicism? Catholicism. Catholicity. Uh, um, well, he was, he was baptized Church of England because his, his, his mother was English uh, and um, never, never went as far as I knew. Um, uh, he would come with my mother and I to mass just as a, as a family thing. Um, Christmas and Easter usually was, was, was when we would, uh, when he would join us. And, um, I guess probably in the mid, mid fifties, um, he said, um, he sort of figured there was, there was a wonderful, I don't know if it's still gettable. It's, it's, it's. It's the only real thing that was ever written that I read, which was really in Gary Cooper's own words. It, it was a, a Saturday Evening Post um, seven part series called, Well, It Was This Way. And George, George Scullin, I think was the writer, was the interviewer. And he really interviewed my father in depth and my father really talked in depth. And, um, and he, goes into a bit of that in that in that series. I don't know where old Saturday Evening Post articles are findable, I gettable, I'm, I'm sure they're online somewhere. Um, I think at some point, you know, as he was getting older, um, one, one Sunday when my mother and I were going to mass, he said, um, hey, wait for me. <laughs> and uh, so he started coming along and there was a, a wonderful priest in Beverly Hills at the Good Shepherd Church, named Father Harold Ford. 
And um, my mother liked Father Ford. Um, uh, can I ask you to excuse me for a moment? We have a little, I have a, have a little problem uh, in the other room. Go ahead. I'll be right back. We still have quite a few questions. I hope we can get through them all. I've enjoyed this interview the most of all the series. I don't know whether you can hear me or not, but. We hear you. Oh, okay. I'm back, I'm, back. I'm sorry. Um, um, Father Ford, who gave terrific sermons, and my mother really liked him, and she invited him home one afternoon. Uh, she said to my father, oh, I'd, I think you'd really like to speak to Father Ford. Uh, he's a, he's a, a regular guy. So uh, he came over for tea, and uh, my mother offered him some tea. He said, no, I'd rather have a drink. <laughs> so he and my father mixed themselves drinks and they went into my father's gun room and uh, they didn't talk about religion or anything. They talked about hunting and fishing uh, and they sort of bonded and uh, became friends. And so my father would like to come to mass to hear Father Ford preach. And I think then one thing led to another and my father decided, well, I guess, you know, maybe at this time in life, I'll you know, make a decision, make a commitment to something bigger than myself. But he, I mean, he was always, I would say he was very spiritual. I think, uh, I think the Indian sense of nature and the spirituality in nature uh, sort of nourished him without any formal ism. Uh, but but he appreciated the discipline and he appreciated and that as I say, then he started to read some of Thomas Merton and he really loved Thomas Merton's approach to uh, the, the life of the spirit. So that's, but he, uh, many people think he became a Catholic when he was told he was ill. That's not true. He was, he was still quite healthy, just, I think he was approaching, I he was 58, I think, or 59. And um, I think life just was um, offering him some new questions that he felt um, making a commitment to Catholicism for him was the right thing to do. Uh, Beth Goff asks, <clears throat> Marion Davies also had a severe stutter your father worked with her on Operator 13 in 1934. She had a prominent role in a lecture that Beth gave, and she understands that Marion was a lovely, fun woman. Do you have any stories about Marion Davies? No, uh, none at all. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting what sort of became a running joke in Hollywood at that time. Uh, the two big gossip columnists were Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. And uh, I think both writers wanted to curry favor with the studios. And Marion Davies was the girlfriend of Hearst. And Luella wrote for the Hearst newspaper. So it became kind of a running joke because at, at every party, at every Hollywood party where Marion Davies was and where Luella was, she would give the rundown the next day of uh, what a wonderful party it was. And there was always a line and Marion never looked lovelier. <laughs> and that was always, uh, always a, a giggle with everybody the next day. And Marion never looked lovelier last night. Are you still offering autographed copies of the books of your father? Yes, I am. Yes, yes, they are. They are um, 
um, they are available. You can you can actually um, write to uh, you can. Let me see. Well, uh, oh, if you want to email that information to Magda, we can include it on our website. Uh, yes, to be ac uh, absolutely accurate, Magda, may I may I send you um, uh, the way to get in touch with? Absolutely, a anything we can do, we'll promote it. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank I, want you one, I want one for myself as well. Uh -oh. <laughs> And uh, because we are running late, uh, Magda, you had a question. Why don't we do, you, give you the last question and I'll turn it back to Foster. Great, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. First, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, well, my first thought is that Love in the Afternoon, I can never watch it enough. It's one of my mm. favorite movies. That's number one. <laughs> and the other thing I want to ask about your father, was he always, did he always want to be an actor? And how do you get a start? Um... Um, Do you have any other jobs? Yeah, uh, no, he wanted to be, uh, he, he wanted to be a political cartoonist. Hmm. Uh, and um, uh, he did a lot of that. Uh, he went to Grinnell um, College for two years and he tried out for the drama school because I think he had a crush on one of the, one of the girls who was in the drama school and they turned him down. <laughs> and many, many years later, he went back to visit and uh, they said, oh, you know, oh, Mr. Cooper, you know, you're such a great actor. You should have been here. You should have been here. He said, no, you were right the first time. <laughs> but um, but actually he got, I think, two reasons. He went to Hollywood for two reasons. One was that one of the gals in the drama school went to Hollywood to hopefully have a film career. And he kind of thought that might be neat to follow her out there and see if he could make any headway. And the other thing was that his, his, his father, who was a Montana Supreme Court judge, his father had some very close friends who lived out there. And um, they said, oh, you know, why doesn't Gary, you know, see how he likes the West and all that. And he went out there and he tried to make living uh, by being an artist and he couldn't and he tried selling encyclopedias and that didn't put much money in his pocket either and he ran into some old cowboy friends from Montana who were working as extras in those little three reelers and they said hey come on you know Coop we make five five dollars a, a fall falling off a horse in front of a camera that they're you know doing that. So um, he, he really was quite broke. And uh, uh, he did he, he, he did some stunt, stunt falling, stunt riding, stunt falling. And um, that was, um, that was sort of the beginning. And then he did some screen tests. Uh, and um, one of the screen tests, when he brushed the dirt and the mud off his face, somebody who was watching said, hey, that guy's pretty good looking. <laughs> let's let's try to test him for something else. Thank you. That's what happened. Hmm. Well, well, thank you so much, Maria. And thank you, Mark, for, and, and of course, Foster, always doing a great job. It's always a pleasure. And uh, thank you everybody for watching. It's oh, thank been you. wonderful. Thank you for inviting me uh, back. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Great, great. Very and, uh, great. Again, for everybody, this will be up on our website probably tomorrow afternoon under the tab that says recent events. And uh, we will include whatever information we can on linking out to the various books. Uh, Foster, do you have any last words? Would you yes, like I, to I think we, I think in fairness, uh, I should ask Maria to tell us just a bit about her mother. And also it's due to her mother that we can claim Maria as a fellow New Yorker. Isn't that right? That after your father's death, your mother came to New York and Park Avenue. Yes, yes, that is 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 true. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because her, her parents were from here. She went to um, she went to Miss Bennett's school for girls and quit <laughs> and had a chaperone and went out to Hollywood at the age of barely eighteen to stay with and live with her uncle Cedric Gibbons who was then married to Dolores Del Rio. And um, 
and actually that's how she met my father first because um, Cedric was a good friend of the actor Richard Bartholmus and he had a boat and they would do Catalina Island weekends. And uh, on one of those weekends was uh, Gary Cooper and uh, voila. <laughs> but your mother wanted to come back to New York after, after your father's death? Mm, uh, I don't think she, she, well, no, what happened is she hadn't made up her mind. I think she was still trying to, you know, put the pieces together. And she went out for dinner one night with um, Swifty Lazar, Irving Lazar, who was the, one of the major literary agents in Hollywood at that time. Um, and Swifty, um, Swifty was a character, <laughs> very, very bright, very, um, a character, I guess say everybody, everybody in Hollywood knows the names Swifty and 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 some of his his nicknames. But um, I love him forever because he said um, he said to my mother, he said, "Let me give you some advice." And she said, "What's that?" And he said, "Don't live in Hershey, Pennsylvania, if you're not in chocolate." <laughs> And then he followed it up by saying, get the hell out of Hollywood if you want to be happy. He said, you've, you know, you've been married to Gary Cooper. Who, who, what, you know, where are you going to go from there? And um, it sort of gave my mother the courage and the impetus. And because she, she did have Eastern roots, but it sort of crystallized in her mind. Yep, you know, um, uh, she wasn't about to be a, the widow Cooper, you know, she was, she was going to make a new life for herself. And, you, and you've been a New Yorker for decades, right? I mean, you, you're more well, a New Yorker than you are a Los Angeles person. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been here more and, and I must say, you know, God works in mysterious ways if it weren't, for my mother's honeymoon to wonderful, her wonderful second husband, Dr. John Converse, um, I wouldn't have met my wonderful husband, Byron Janice, because it was on her honeymoon in the south of France that Byron and I met. So whoever writes the big plan, I, <laughs> it's awesome. That's a wonderful way to stop. I, I'm sure all of you, join me in thanking Maria Cooper for a really splendid interview. Thank you, Maria. Oh, sir, I love talking to you anytime, always. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Magda, uh, why don't you have the final word since this is our last event this year? Thank you very much. It's a wonderful way to end it. And everybody, thank you, Mark, for being there, and I think we make a great team. <laughs> we'll hopefully we'll continue, and uh, everybody keep safe and uh, love to you all. Thank you for coming. Let me know what's happening next year. We oh, will. Yeah, thank you, and hopefully we'll, we could host you at the at the club. Oh, uh, that would be yeah. That's that's a goal, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Be well. You too. You too. Be well, everyone. Please. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.